Welcome back. We have heard quite a lot today about issues of ethics and regulations related to artificial intelligence and its deployment. And so we will now shift into the final session of the symposium titled AI Ethics and Policies, which will explore critical personal and societal questions related to the ethical deployment to use and use of artificial intelligence, as well as questions about regulations and laws, both national and international, governing AI and our interaction with it. As in the previous sessions, we will hear from three speakers, followed by a moderated conversation and audience Q&A. Our speakers in this session are Mutalian Kande, founding CEO of AI for the People, co-founder of FAUMA, and a master's candidate at Columbia University. Justice Mariano Florentino Coyar, Associate Justice on the Supreme Court of California, and Herman Flager, visiting professor at Stanford Law School. And Mark Kane, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Lead at the World Economic Forum. And our moderator for this session is Professor Francine Berman, Research Professor and Stuart Rice Honorary Chair at the College of Information and Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Mutalian Conde. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be here and um, to get us started. I want to look at really some of the applications of living in an ethical um, AI world. In 2019, I co-authored a report with my colleague, Jesse Daniels, a sociologist at the City University of New York and Dark Shin Mayer, computer science professor at Bucknell. And we were looking at what would it mean to live in a racially um, literate tech world? We did an ethnographic um, interview of 30 tech leaders across Silicon Valley, and we found these three things. The first thing was that cognitively, we had to let our colleagues know on the computer science side that technologies express bias. They are technical machines that take on social systems and those have real life impacts as I'm going to describe. Secondly, the social, the technologies, and in this case, social medias have an emotional appeal. You too could be Kim Kardashian. You too could be somebody who is an ordinary person one day, a billionaire the next or close to, marry a rock star and do all of these things using these algorithmic systems that will recommend uh, people to come see you via social media. We recognized that this was very, very dangerous. And in 2019, I worked with Congresswoman um, Yvette Clark on the introduction of the Algorithmic Accountability Act to the US House of Representatives. And what we were trying to do there was to try and introduce this idea of impact assessment into the algorithmic systems that we create. So if a technology was deemed to be dangerous, we, would we were then able to make a determination on whether it should be reduced to released to the market. We've had laws before. One of the ones that we looked at was Shelley, Shelley v. Kramer, a 1948 Supreme Court decision that outlawed racial covenants in housing. And what was so interesting about that decision was although this practice was outlawed, the practice continued for another 20 years. And it was the civil rights movement that really got us to the Fair Housing Act that stopped this practice. So we can both have laws, but if they're not enforced, how useful are they? And that's really where my, the rest of my comments lie. So um, in 2016, we had an election and in that election, um, we found out through special um, agent Robert Mueller, I'm sorry, I sit in Brooklyn, New York. So obviously we have to have a siren. Um, I found that there was interference. And in the article that I started this slide with, the, the specific example I'm, going, I'm pointing to is 70,000 people in the city of Detroit, which is 89% Black, not voting at the top of the ticket, and in doing so, swinging the state. And the question that Muller was looking at was why. And it, we found that social media algorithms, recommendation algorithms, were dissuading Black populations from voting. In 2021, social media is still the majority way that most adults in the US get their news. So this really made us interested in real world impacts of um, unregulated algorithmic systems. The same idea that black people shouldn't vote, fill in the reason, was also followed up in 2020 through the narrative of Kamala Harris was not black. 
This led to an online campaign led by, by Black social media users telling Black people not to vote. This was one of the artifacts that's actually part of my thesis work in which they showed us how not to vote and exactly how not to vote in the premier election. And it led to tweets like this, I'll be voting down ballot, which is the practice that I describe in Detroit for obvious reasons. Um, I'm still investigating those, so I will let you know. So going back to this framework that I introduced, racial literacy has these three components. Cognitively, this idea of swaying Black, the behavior of Black populations by the Russians, it's actually really old. This is the Scottsboro Boys incident, which was uh, nine Black boys in the South were accused of looking at white women, whistling at white women, choose your poison. Uh, they were supposed to be lynched and the American Communist Party came in and not only provided them with lawyers, but, but really started a newspaper campaign that raised public consciousness about this case and ultimately freed them. That same type of targeting by the Russians in 2016 happened, but this time it was algorithmically. These algorithms within social media, primarily Facebook, were, dri were driving um, users to particular types of content. And much like the Scottsboro Boy incident in the 1930s, it was this idea that the Russians were implanting about how, when, and why Black people should vote. Going to the emotional part of the racial literacy framework, Muller in his report found that the, the Facebook groups that were created had names like this one that you see, the Blacktivist, Woke Blacks, Black Life, not Black Lives, Black Life Matter. These were, these were communities in which Black, Black people were having conversations and, encouraging, and ultimately encouraged not to vote. And when we looked at the ethnographic data, many of the interviews were saying things like they felt seen and heard, when in actual fact, they were being algorithmically tracked into, uh, into Facebook groups that would encourage them not to take up the franchise. And we saw this again in 2020 around Kamala Harris, this idea that she is not Black, do not vote at this point in the election, and then um, fulfilling some type of um, agenda by the Russian government. In that case, the third part of the racial literacy framework, which is action plan, the action plan there was to influence the outcomes of both 20, 2016 and 2020. And my question then becomes, if the Russian government showed this level of racial literacy and technology, why don't we? Because when we don't face the facts that technologies have social lives and take on social meanings, that they look at these divisive issues that we emotionally cannot handle, we put everything at risk, including our democracy. And that's not just a black issue. So in closing from my portion, I was very nervous that I couldn't let you know what I've been studying over the last five years in, in 12 minutes, but it seems like I'm gonna be able to make it. The Algorithmic Accountability Act is good, but if the Algorithmic Accountability Act, much like Shirley v. Kramer, is not enforced, is not followed, then we have to start to ask, and where I would love this conversation to go, is how do we develop regulatory systems that actually matter, that have the social support that the Fair Housing Act did, that the Civil Rights Act did. And that's what led to the enforcement of a law that had 20 years been passed. So without further ado, Justice um, Cuellar, it's my pleasure to hand over the virtual floor and I'm looking forward to being in conversation. Thank you so much, Mutali. That's really uh, fascinating and, and terrific and thought provoking and congrats on all the great your, uh, work you're doing on AI for the people. I love both the ambition of the goal of your organization and also its uh, enormous importance. I wanna start by just giving a little context to how I got interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, I've been a judge now for seven years and for much of my career before that, I was an academic with stints in the government at several points, but I started off life in academia at Harvard. Uh, often found myself in Radcliffe Yard actually, thinking it was actually the most beautiful green space in Cambridge and uh, enjoyed uh, many afternoons uh, 
telling myself that I would actually get through all my reading and almost never actually achieving it. But some of the reading that I did in Radcliffe Yard had to do with artificial intelligence. This was early 1990s. I started off as a psychology concentrator and I have um, more pleasant memories of Radcliffe Yard than William James Hall, where I took many of these classes and it's probably the least beautiful building in Cambridge. But there were uh, great discussions there that I took part in about the brain, the human brain and how the experiments around uh, trying to instantiate intelligence and really basic pieces of software back then could give us some insight into what was really happening in the human brain. It's been a very crazy and interesting journey for those of us interested in AI, particularly those of us who've had a separate life in other things too. But in the last six, seven, eight years, I've been pulled back into this field and found that the conversations we can now have about the role of AI in society, in our lives, in law, in how we govern in global affairs have become rather pressing and not just science fiction. So I want to take a step back, given that background, and share a bit of what I'm observing, partly in my role as a public official, partly in my role as a scholar, what I hope we can all be thinking about if we really want to understand the intersection of ethics and AI over the next few years. So I'll start by noting that there's a piece of this discussion that is now pretty familiar to most people in the audience and reflects the fact that AI problems and the ethical and policy consequences of AI have become part of our daily lives. So if some machine learning algorithm is advising the decision-making of an official in a bank about uh, loan risk, or um, a piece of software that is reviewing not only our words, but our nonverbal communication is doing something to inform the choice of an HR person to screen a bunch of candidates applying for a job, or doctors are beginning to use AI software to take three or four different possible conditions they think somebody might have and narrow it down to one or two. Or as we were just hearing, uh, algorithms are being used uh, by not only political consultants in the US to figure out what voters to target, but by even our adversaries, then all of that tells us that in the here and now, there are questions about bias, about privacy, and about what counts as our own choice versus about you know a choice that is being influenced by an algorithm that we're facing in the here and now. I think these questions are obviously important. I don't think they all have easy answers. I think they're, they tend to be characterized by a situation where a piece of software is either advising a decision maker or targeting a particular person and the information that person sees. And I don't want for a moment to suggest those questions are not important because in particular, I think these questions of bias are forcing us to think much more explicitly, not only about implicit bias in human decision-making, but various forms of bias that creep into the mechanisms that are making decisions with us and for us. That's been true of organizations to some time, but now, now we, we see it in uh, algorithms, even in the ways these algorithms communicate with us in the design of user interfaces. Um, and as a judge, I think that some of the hard questions for my field, as you know, the, the judiciary will be about how we expect software to be designed such that judges and other legal decision makers have access to recommendations that are usefully based in data, but don't get so much of a push to decide something that they stop using their own individual judgment, which is important because we depend on our own brains to communicate with each other and figure out what moral decisions to make. In the farther future, let's say, I don't know, 100 years from now, it's, it's hard to tell, but at some point in the future, I doubt this moment will never come. I do not think it will come in the next 20 years we will face a very different set of ethical questions. These are questions that are more analogous to the questions that my colleagues in the legal system sometimes have struggled with involving animals and involving corporations. How much do we protect something that is alive? A corporation is alive because the law deems it to be alive. It has a separate personhood and we protect it. We even protect its first amendment rights. An animal may not be smart, um, but, and may have a lived experience different from a corporation, whatever lived experience means, but at various points we decide that corporations deserve protection. Uh, so, and, and that animals do too. And that animals might be vulnerable, 
because uh, they suffer when we let bad things to happen to them, particularly the ones that we identify with, like our pets, uh, maybe less so an insect that we crush. But imagine now what we might face when a piece of software pleads with us very eloquently, very thoughtfully, drawing on everything it can sort of amass from the Schlesinger Library or anywhere else about why it deserves the freedom to decide what it's going to do with itself and why it has an ethical right not to be unplugged. For reasons we can get into, I suspect it would be a mistake to assume that that question will never come. I don't think it will come very, very soon, but I think it will come. So then I wanna leave you with the, my thought about the questions that are more awkward and maybe even more challenging than the bias and privacy questions we're facing now, but they're actually coming far sooner to my mind than the personhood question. So these are questions that I would say are in the fertile and complicated middle that have to do with simulated artificial general intelligence, what I call SAGI. What is that? Well, artificial general intelligence will get us very far to the personhood questions. That's the instantiation of something difficult to distinguish from human intelligence, maybe not taking quite the same properties. I think it would be folly to assume we're like 10 years away from that or five years away from that. I don't know how far away we are from that. That's a good and difficult technical conversation. I don't think, however, we're that far away from a set of systems that can persuasively simulate intelligence to lay people to most people without suggesting that that is sort of a moral or ethical marker of true intelligence. Notice the distinction, right? We can think that even a fairly souped up chatbot is not so different from the kind of communication we get on Twitter. In fact, Twitter almost by design is meant to limit the range of human expression in a way that actually makes it easier to fake, you know, CF, Russian influence operations, right? So, but, but it's gonna get much better than that. We're talking about systems that will be good at nuancing their own expressions of emotion to us, even if uh, they're not genuine, that will be much better at understanding, just like Spotify is at picking our playlists, what we love to listen to, what compliments really make us truly happy, uh, what secret fears and anxieties we have. Um, those systems will raise questions about whether we want to recognize people's relationships with these systems. We might be perfectly uh, uh, well-informed, we at scholars, maybe uh, policymakers in saying, well, that's not the same as having a, a relationship with a person. Uh, we're not ready to give personhood to that system. But what if a person who wants to have a relationship with that system disagrees with us? This is not a, a left-right issue, I think, as much. It's a, a foreshadowing of the kind of political cleavages we will be facing in the months and years to come. What about super persuasion? Not just the persuasion we get from a really carefully timed and tailored ad when we use a search engine or we use the newsfeed of a social media platform, but something that is so well designed to appeal exactly to us that it nudges us in the deepest ways. Like, what do you want to do with your life? Whom do you want to marry? Uh, what level of disclosure do we expect about those kinds of super persuasive efforts? How do we even define them if we want to? And then last but certainly not least, when a system is good enough to really create the illusion of intelligence, how much more comfortable we're we gonna feel delegating decision-making power to that system for good or ill, right? That'll be a terrific teacher of, of kids in poor neighborhoods who don't have access to great teachers right now. Uh, that might also be a good judge for simple cases where a person needs to feel some dignity and might feel that if a piece of software gets really good at creating that sense of belonging. But obviously there are gonna be some disagreements about when it's appropriate to delegate and when it isn't. And I want us to be prepared. I'll close just by noting that um, there will be global competition around these simulated AGI systems that will make it really difficult to create global norms about their use for military applications, for persuasion. Uh, but there will also be real values disagreements domestically even such that regulation will be very important to my mind. And I think we have some, some running starts on that score with medical devices that have some of these properties, but there's a lot more to do. But I think we should not be naive about the really deeply cultural conflicts we're gonna face here. So I just note that when we think about what works in America and there's a lot that does, we also see some things that have been divisive and reflect things that don't work. And debates about issues like abortion and guns are perhaps uh, reflective of that. And I think we're gonna have more debates along those lines to come.
And with that, I will turn over the mic to Mark. Thank you so much, Justice Koyar, and, and thank you to uh, uh, Mutale as well. Such provocative uh, presentations and, and thoughts there, uh, which I think segue very well into what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, more the global perspective um, and what we're seeing internationally in terms of the drive by governments, but also by industry and by civil society to put in place the kind of norms, the kind of standards, the kind of guardrails and, and, and thoughtful approaches that have been so uh, thoughtfully um, uh, gestured towards by, by the two previous speakers. So very briefly, I'm, I'm Mark Kane. I'm with the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private partnership. Uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland, with offices in San Francisco, where I'm based, in Beijing, uh, Mumbai, and Tokyo. Uh, and the, the forum works internationally in a multi-stakeholder manner uh, involving governments, uh, industry, and civil society to try to address and, and, and create shared momentum on some of the problems that can't be handled by any one of those actors individually. Uh, AI ethics and responsible AI is a very good example. Uh, we also work on issues like climate change, the future of work, um, as well as uh, trying to uh, shift the, the, the global um, uh, you know, financial and investment system towards a greater focus on ESGs, uh, environmental, social, and governance, uh, that is. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring that back into the conversation in a minute uh, when I talk a little bit about industry. Uh, so we work with, with governments around the world, and I want to just take that macro view uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, in terms of what we see uh, in the work that we do, um, it has already been mentioned earlier today that uh, there's a, a lot of discussion about the kind of divergence and competition between the US, China, and the EU on artificial intelligence, both in terms of the development of AI technologies, but also in terms of the development of these standards, norms, policies, laws, soft governance tools to try to shape it and maximize its benefits while minimizing its risks. Uh, one thing that we see less talked about, but which we observe quite a lot in our work is that there's actually another divide, which is really between those three players on the one hand who have developed a lot of AI capabilities uh, and the rest of the world where the, uh, the kind of levels of uh, technical competency, policy competency in this area uh, is much more heterogeneous and much more of a patchwork. Uh, and with the um, kind of exponential uh, nature of AI technology, you know, the fact that success really breeds success, that access to data is very important, uh, we see a real potential risk for even greater divergence between uh, the sort of global AI haves and the global AI have nots, where some of these leads that are being um, developed by, by some of the first mover countries uh, could really get very entrenched uh, over the years ahead, particularly as uh, global fragmentation on a number of other axes seems to unfortunately only be increasing. Uh, so in terms of that kind of macro view, I'll, I'll sort of just leave with a, a, a projection, uh, which we'll, we'll see if it comes true. But um, uh, I believe it was PwC, the consultancy, which forecasts that AI will um, create roughly $15 trillion in value to the global economy by 2030, which is a huge number. Uh, and the question that I ask myself every day and that we think about a lot with a lot of the stakeholders we work with in countries outside North America, the EU and China is, you know, where will that money go? Who will benefit from that value? And what can we do to ensure that it is as well distributed and inclusive as possible? Um, so, you know, with that as the kind of global macro context, I'm just going to dive in a little bit into kind of what we're seeing uh, on the government sphere and what we're seeing in the industry side. Um, so we've heard some, some really interesting cases from the previous two speakers about uh, the kinds of issues that governments have to face when they uh, move into regulation. I couldn't agree more uh, with Mutale that regulation matters. Uh, it is why I think, uh, you know, we're having this panel. It's why there are similar panels and processes happening uh, really at a, a, a rapidly growing pace around the world, which has been encouraging uh, to see. And one of the things that, that I just want to call out is that um, when we end up getting really into the weeds with governments on AI policymaking, one thing that we find is that it, it's actually a more expansive conversation inside of most governments than the 
frame that, 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 that we're approaching it through in this panel and that, that I often approach it through around responsible AI and AI ethics and how do you put in place the right laws and policies. And there's a tension because while most governments uh, that we speak to are very concerned about the kind of harms, the kind of inequities, the kinds of um, uh, you know risks that uh, are being created and could be created, particularly under some of the uh, sort of more future and further future scenarios that Justice Cuellar laid out, where you know it really gets very uh, uh, kind of close to our everyday lives, uh, which it already is. So governments are very concerned about that, but at the same time, governments see that you know fifteen trillion dollar prize and they also think about it from the perspective of industrial policy so how do we develop as strong of an ai industry in our country as possible so that we can compete in this world where ai capabilities may actually be critical to having competitive advantage and so there are often tensions and and there are sometimes trade offs between these efforts to ensure that ai is developed responsibly and in the public interest while also ensuring that it's developed as fast and as um, uh, you know capable as it can be, uh, so that's something that we're we're seeing a lot of, and I expect to see more of. Uh, another thing that I, I think is interesting in terms of the the government um, kind of process on AI is that there's a really interesting, and, and I imagine this is something that Justice Square you see all the time, and, and Mutale as well in the issues that you study. Uh, there's a, an interesting kind of choice in some of these areas around. You know, how much do we need to create new laws and new regulations versus how much can we apply existing statutes, for example, some of the non-discrimination laws that Mutale mentioned to this new domain where it's actually you know, some of the same issues that we're talking about, bias and lending. I mean, we were talking about bias and lending decades ago, um, facilitated by this new tool. And so the question is, at what point is something so sufficiently different because of the way in which AI is being used in it, that it needs to have some sort of bespoke approach that kind of recognizes those particular AI capabilities. Uh, but one thing that we see is that a lot of governments, including the US governments, actually already have a lot of tools in the toolkit, which can be used right now um, based on some of these other competencies and um, statutes that are on the books. So, you know, lastly, on the government side, I think, you know, we've seen, as has been mentioned, a proliferation of new policies. It's very exciting. There was the EU AI, AI Act earlier this year. Uh, NIST and the Government Accountability Office have come out with guidelines. We've seen FDA guidelines for medical devices, uh, as well as legislation, including the AI Accountability Act that Mutale uh, worked on. Uh, we've also seen some very interesting moves in government around government's use of AI as, as, as a, a, a user, uh, sometimes a developer, but sometimes a purchaser of third-party AI. Uh, this is something that we've worked a lot on in terms of putting in place procurement guidelines with government so that they can ensure that the AI that they buy firstly is uh, de-risked and uh, has been properly assessed and uh, they know that it's going to be efficacious, good value for money and also ethical. Uh, but we also see that there's um, uh, you know opportunities for government to use its procurement as a kind of soft governance approach where they may not be able to regulate uh, and this is the case in the UK where we did a lot of work with their government, they weren't necessarily ready to regulate because they wanted to see how the technology was gonna develop. And so they used their procurement rules to send a softer signal to the market to say, look, here's what's probably gonna be okay. Uh, here's what you should avoid. Um, we have seen, uh, I think, very encouraging um, developments at the international organization level. I completely agree with Justice Cuellar that the setting of global norms is incredibly difficult, and I think it will continue to be. Uh, but we have seen, for example, uh, ISO and the IEEE looking at the level of technical standards, trying to create some uh, interoperability globally and some shared vocabularies and taxonomies. Uh, we've seen UNESCO, the OECD, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights within the UN system, as well as the Secretary General's office through his high-level panel on digital cooperation bring these issues to the forefront. And I'm just gonna you know, um, end with a couple of remarks on kind of what we're seeing on uh, the industry side, because it's all obviously uh, very closely bound up with what's going on on the policy side. Uh, you know, If you listen to the big consultancies and analysts uh, around the world, uh, what the general consensus seems to be these days is that uh, industry adoption of AI, for instance, within the Fortune 500 or the big companies uh, is wide, but not deep. So most Fortune 500 companies are using AI. Very few of them are using it in more than one or two or three uh, relatively narrow areas. 
Uh, so what, what's been found and um, what we've heard from a lot of companies we work with is that it's actually hard to realize the promised value of AI harder than is often thought because it's not about just taking AI and bolting it onto the existing uh, organizational processes. It, it's, you really actually have to do some kind of retooling of the organizational processes and the workflows to be able to maximize the value of AI. That requires more investment. It requires different skills. It requires more capacity. Um, the other thing we see with industry is that there has been, um, I think, you know, encouragingly a huge flurry of new ethical guidelines that have been put out, you know, new principles for AI uh, by the OECD and by others. Uh, the, 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 the trick is how do you actually operationalize them in the more granular domains of product design and engineering, uh, you know, legal processes, um, uh, governance you know, by boards, for example. So, so, so we're working a lot with industry to actually take those principles and kind of break them down into, you know, what does that mean if you're a general counsel? What does that mean if you're a product engineer? What does that mean if you're a board member? Uh, so, you know, we see, um, you know, a really complex and growing landscape of, of these kinds of efforts happening in companies, in governments. Civil society has a really important voice here uh, and a growing voice, which is very encouraging. Uh, we're working at the World Economic Forum to try to connect the dots between those initiatives. Uh, we fear a situation where there is um, a huge amount of fragmentation, lots of experiments being run in lots of different places, but without the ability to feed back the insights and the uh, lessons learned and the models that are you know, being worked out between them. And so our work really is to try to weave those things together to elevate the best practices and approaches and uh, try to drive towards more of that global interoperability, coordination and collaboration uh, that Justice Cuellar mentioned, acknowledging that it, it is an uphill battle every day uh, and we need a lot more people uh, putting their shoulder to the wheel. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Professor Berman, and thank you again to all the panelists for such a, such a great uh, and stimulating uh, start. All right. Well, uh, these were an amazing set of comments and um, we're getting some questions, but we're going to have a little discussion first. And, um, you know, I wanted to start with maybe the most fundamental question we've been talking about all day. And I have to say, I, I've, uh, I've been watching the symposium and it's fantastic. Um, so I want to tell all of the speakers that it's just been very, very thought provoking. But the fundamental question for us is, you know, we live in the information age in a technology driven world. And at the end of the day, we want to know, you know, how can we make sure that that technology is good for us? And that's particularly a question we want to ask about artificial intelligence, because it's such a tremendously powerful uh, tool. And, you know, when we ask is technology good for us, we especially want to ask you know, part of that being good for us is being ethical. We want to make sure it's ethically designed. We want to make sure it's ethically used. We want to make sure that it has positive benefits and um, the fewest possible catastrophic results. So um, all of you have talked in some way about regulation and um, the need for kind of adult supervision in that world, if you think about it. And um, I enjoyed your comments, Justice Cryer, when you talked about, in some sense, not just the rights and responsibilities of the people in that world, um, but of the autonomous entities in that world themselves. And you could imagine, you know, we already need to make priorities about, you know, who gets the bandwidth, maybe your smart toaster or your smart refrigerator, but, um, you know, will we have these situations where uh, there's a robot going into a toxic environment and there are some sort of resources that they need? Um, do I still get to win because I'm a human being who wants to stream Netflix? And I think we will have all kinds of really interesting questions. So let me ask all of you, um, what regulation do we need? And, you know, just to follow up on things that Mutale was saying um, and that Mark was saying, uh, you know, how do we make uh, any regulation we pass effective? Who's accountable when things go wrong? And, you know, when you have both humans and machines in this kind of crazy world, uh, you know, that's going to become a really, really challenging thing to think about. So um, uh, let's see, uh, Justice Cuellar, why don't you start? 
Thank you, Professor Berman. Great questions. And I'm just really enjoying the panel as well. I find my co-panelists really fascinating, their perspectives, learning from them. I guess, let me start with a, a, a slight piece of optimism, because I think it's important to put in perspective the headaches, the challenges, the difficulties, but also the reality, which boils down to, to me that we don't need to start from scratch. Human society is old, and we've been thinking about regulation for almost as long as human society, first at the kind of norm level of tribes and families, but now at the level of impersonal societies. And so I'd start by noting this, you know, something that Mark also alluded to, query how much we need AI-specific regulatory rules. I'm going to mention two areas where I think we do, but then the bigger point is I we actually don't the, 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 the biggest regulatory thrust we can make is to take a set of standards, rules, legal approaches that don't work perfectly, but we have them for a reason, to protect our environment, to protect our health, to protect each other from each other, like tort law, criminal law. And almost all of that body of law and regulation has an AI piece, a, a capacity to be applied to AI that requires some judgment. In the political environment we are in, there are strong views about the pros and cons of that that is sometimes a little subtle or not fully transparent or maybe at least not fully articulated. What I mean by that is when somebody says, technology is moving too fast for the law, we need a totally different framework. That reflects the point of view about the obsolescence of our existing law. Now, tort law says that I can do a lot of stuff. I can yell you know, in a park about the importance of my political ideas. I mean, not as a judge, I can't do that, but the point is people can do that, right? I can't take a can of yellow paint and dump it on my neighbor's car. I don't think we need a totally new framework to regulate a robot doing that that was instructed by me. And even if the robot does that not instructed by anyone, but was designed to serve other functions and does that, we actually have a body of law that covers that, like a vicarious liability and negligence and so on. So like, let's not reinvent the wheel. Now, two areas where I think we do need regulation are weapons, particularly lethal ones that are enabled and uh, triggered uh, entirely or almost entirely by AI. And the very uh, most uh, cutting edge experiments that um, get us ever closer to AGI and that might leverage um, activities that happen a little in the wild, by which I mean like in the internet itself, I think it would be uh, not great to have no um, set of standards governing that um, the, the limits of that research. I'm not talking about garden variety stuff. I'm talking about stuff that can really sort of adapt and begin to operate in ways that we don't control fully. When you talk about um, AI as weapons, and I want to get to the other panelists too, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's weapons as guns, but there's also weapons as, you know, destroying somebody's reputation or doing other kinds of things. Um, it, or skewing realities or misinformation or, you know, uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities. How can we, you know, what kinds of mechanisms do we need? It might not be law, but, but what do we need to be able to control it when so much happens sort of in an unseen way? Great question. So I'd say for starters, I would just, in the terms of the hard AI uh, focused regulation, I would just say if we can figure out some good standards to apply that might even actually work beyond one country that apply to the lethal use of force mm -hmm. that is enabled by AI, that's a terrific start. But I take your point about, you know, destroying service repetition. I just note this is actually a good illustration of how sometimes the issue isn't like we need new law, it can be we need old law, right? Let's remember that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act created a massive carve out from a lot of bodies of law that get at this very problem of destroying people's reputation. And, you know, I'm not here to take a position on do you just repeal that and let state tort law play its role, you know, defamation, libel. But I am saying, like, let's remember that oftentimes the problems we back ourselves into are because we have failed to apply a body of law that is not perfect, but that has its roots in what it is that we expect from each other. Oh, that's fascinating. Mutali, what's your thoughts on all of this? Oh my goodness, I, I couldn't um, agree more, Justice. Uh, I think that I've, I've definitely found a member of my tribe in um, some of your remarks. I think in terms of 
what regulation we need to i just to echo what's just being said we need to look at our current legal norms and i'm not just talking about national norms as those in the us um I'm very outspoken on the idea uh, that civil rights law, for example, is very weak in, in my humble view, in the sense that it has to be, um, you know, has to be intentional. It has to be the whites only sign in order for it to be to be inflicted. But then what happens when you have uh, Facebook? There are others. I'm not just going to keep talking about Facebook, but Facebook creating algorithms where you can decide who sees a housing ad. So you're not I'm sorry. So you're putting up the virtual whites only side sign through this type of um, targeted advertising. Well, we already have norms there, maybe not on the civil rights side, but certainly in human rights law, we have this idea of disparate impact. So if there is a case, if a case can be found where an algorithmic system, a, a technological system really harms the most vulnerable. So then again, thinking about protected classes, women, people, um, you know, people who are negatively racialized, people living with dis disabilities, does that line up with the values of the society in which we live? And this is where my, um, where the tension came in when we were looking at things like the Algorithmic Accountability Act or deepfakes, where we had to understand that the government and um, priority, at least it was in 2017 when we first started this work, was to, create an, a, was to create an enabling business environment for the development of artificial intelligence. And what that enabling uh, business environment meant were special attention to the future of work, it also meant special attention to industry. So separate to future of work, they actually had another one for industry. And then in number four was special considerations to society. And I would argue that what we really what we need to really regulate are those policies and practices that further disadvantage traditionally marginalized groups by looking at existing bodies of law. In terms of what would be effective, we also need a cultural strategy. Because I do, we, in order for a law to be enforced in a way that protects the most vulnerable, we also need a well-educated um, judiciary. We need um, case law to really push this um, on the progressive side, on the side of the human, on the side of human rights. And then we need a society that can accept it. And I always go back to Shirley versus Kramer white people did not want to live next door to black people. So even though it had been outlawed, the cultural practice of living in an all white neighborhood and what it meant to be safe between 1948 and 1968 meant that we needed a social movement. We needed that one charismatic figure, um, in this case, um, gendered as a man to come and tell us that he had a dream that we could actually live next door to each other. And if I had been in the crowd, I would have shouted, we already have that dream, nobody will follow the law. So we also need people to understand what we're regulating and then accept that we need it. And then the third thing, this was so interesting in terms of accountability and something that I'm still wrestling with. When IP law dictates that we can't actually see the algorithm, who do we hold accountable? And this is where I go back to impact. If you're not gonna let me see your base code, then we have to start um, moving away from unintentional, uh, unintentional harm and towards a much uh, stronger, that if you know better, you should do better. If the Russians can be racially literate in technology, the Americans can too. And you should be held accountable for willful um, ignorance. And you can imagine that that, um, that position isn't, isn't popular, but it gets us towards uh, this question of accountability. That's fantastic. I have another question and I kind of wanted to ask Mark about this because he comes from so many different points of view. And it's kind of a, a question about metrics of success. So, you know, we all know that we want AI and technology in general to be ethical, but, you know, what does exactly that mean? And, you know, in some sense, you know, many may argue we're not even sure um, what a universal or cohesive set of ethics is in any given community. You know, the, the ethics in one country or one group 
may change uh, uh, from that in another group. And so um, part of the problem in creating some sort of structure, some sort of oversight structure and legal structure and enforcement structure is, you know, we have to know what we're doing and we have to know when we do it. So I guess my question for you is both from the cross sector perspective and from the international perspective, um, you know, do we have some kind of pragmatic strategies um, to understand what ethics is, to actually regulate it in some way where we get the outcomes we want uh, to measure it? It's such a great question, uh, Professor Berman. Uh, and I think, you know, this, this conversation, I, I'm just laughing because it's, it's a conversation that comes up uh, almost weekly, I think, uh, in the work that we've done internationally. You know, as soon as you start talking about taking an ethical approach to these challenges around AI, you know, the first question is, well, who's ethics? And ethics aren't universal. And um, that's, you know, uh, something that um, has been brought into, I think, very sharp relief by these challenges that AI has, has presented to us, because you have uh, this set of ethical challenges, ethical issues, ethical frameworks. You have the law, which is different in different places, uh, both in terms of its content and also the ways in which it functions and enforcement and so on, uh, which has been, I think, very well um, uh, fleshed out by my, my co-panelists. Uh, and then you also have um, uh, there on the other side, the question of human rights, which is uh, something that we see very prominently coming into conflict, actually, in terms of this uh, sort of international process to figure out what should the global norms to the extent that we can develop them, what should they be? And there's really been a very um, robust and, and, and contentious at times conflict between this question of human rights as a basis for AI policy, governance, regulation, et cetera, which is what is proposed and advocated for by uh, the UN, for example, um, which is obviously you know, charged with um, stewarding the human rights agenda uh, uh, through the world and, 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 and growing it. And um, there are very specific um, uh, you know, legal and, and treaty instruments that exist around human rights. Um, they mean very specific things uh, in a way that when you talk about ethics, uh, it is a little bit more fuzzy and gray. Uh, and so I think that, that this is you know, something that um, is still very live and, and, and playing out right now. And, and in terms of kind of your, your specific question of, you know, what are what kind of pragmatic strategies do we have to, you know, figure out if, you know, if we're going to say we should base it in the societal values or, you know, the ethical, um, you know, framework of a particular group of people, you know, whether it's at the national level or at, uh, you know, a smaller subnational jurisdictional level, or perhaps even at the global level, um, I, I think that in the end, uh, you, know, you can't get around the the, the need for a, a, a much more robust public engagement um, kind of approach than we have. And, and that, you know, is something that uh, is talked about a lot. I think it's something that's very hard to do, uh, partly because it, I think, uh, you know, sort of presupposes uh, a certain amount of education and literacy amongst stakeholders who might participate in those processes, uh, which is, is is not yet there. Uh, one thing that we've seen, you know, we've worked with a number of governments to create national AI conversations. Uh, one of them was in, in New Zealand, which I think was quite successful. Uh, the problem, of course, with a national AI conversation is that, you know, who shows up to a national AI conversation that's open to everyone? Well, a very small subset of people who are thinking about AI already and feel like they have something to say about it at a national AI conversation. And so, you know, we, I guess, on the practical strategies question and, and just very specifically look at it in two ways. You know, one is creating those approaches, those tools, those strategies, you know, the national AI conversation work, it's available on our website. You know, we hope that others can use it and learn from it. Uh, but, but the other side of the coin is um, actually educating, doing the capacity building, doing the communication, doing the public engagement. You know, it, it, it is something that politicians, I think, should be talking more about. It affects all of their constituencies and their citizens. Uh, it's something that I think all of us, you know, in universities, in nonprofits, perhaps in the judiciary, can be doing a better job of. Uh, and I think we're, we're really at the beginning of that journey, honestly. Can I pile on and just add one more thing in response to Mark's very Please interesting do. comments? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, 
one of the reasons, I'll uh, just say one reason why I agree with, with Mark, the thrusters comment, but then one reason why I'm concerned about that agreement. Um, I think Mark is right that we, we can't seriously expect to navigate the value and ethics questions around AI if we don't have more of the public aware that those questions affect their kids, affect their lives, affect their livelihood, the chemicals they're exposed to, the jobs they're gonna have, the people they're gonna marry and so on. So yes, more engagement, more awareness. I will note that in my experience, the relationship between greater public awareness of an issue and good policy, and we can define good in a lot of different ways, is not linear, um, at least not linear in the upward direction. And you know, that's sort of that was where I was ending my comments earlier, like, like a sense of awareness that we owe it to the world to, to help make them more aware. But we should be prepared for getting our wish granted on that score, and then the, the really difficult um, schisms that, that can arise. And to that point, I just note that among my uh, fellow Silicon Valley residents, I've noticed sometimes that while there's a good and growing awareness of the need for careful ethical thinking around AI, there has sometimes been in the past, I think less so now, but in the past, the sense that the goal is to sort of align AI with human values. And that phrase or framework can be utterly, um, it can be really tricky and, and maybe not quite the right analogy for some of the reasons both Mark and Mutala have raised. And that is we humans don't do great at simply converging on like what the right values are. Instead, we design very tenuous and imperfect mechanisms for resolving our disputes, however imperfectly and temporarily while we figure out how best to channel our arguments, right? So that's sort of what the legal system is. It's what democracy is. Even authoritarian regimes, they struggle with this question. Uh, I don't think they have the perfect answer there either, but let's be honest about our level of uh, continuing disagreement and that will continue. Well, I mean, here's some follow up on that because, you know, it's it's interesting to think about um, what are the ethical rights and responsibilities of these various groups involved. If you think about um, the regulators and and you know perhaps the goal is you know uh, AI and ethical AI in the public interest. You think about the consumers themselves. You think about the creators of AI, you know, these are people from my community and, and we have all kinds of things we're thinking about. Mutale will um, relate to this as well. You know, you think about whether you have bias in the training site, you think about whether you have bias in the model, you think about whether you have bias in the interpretation. I mean, the fact is you probably have bias in all of them. And the question is, um, can you somehow create the system so you get the kinds of outcomes you want? But um, you will have conflicts between, you know, what consumers think are ethical and what creators think are ethical and what public servants think are ethical. How do we, how do we kind of navigate that space? Any of you? I think we have to um, get back to dreaming about the type of societies we want to create. And this actually gets us back to this idea that we are imperfect. Um, as people. And I think that one of the things that mostly influences me is having grown up in the United Kingdom, where there was this idea after the Second World War that we would have a welfare state that took you from cradle to grave. And the job of the state was um, in that post war period to serve and protect its people. That eventually, you know, th that has been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. And my earliest memory of that was around Thatcher. So that definitely was not the society that I grew up in, but that was the ambition of the society. And that has somewhat stayed that to come into um, a, a legal system like the United States and do the work that I did and see that the first priority was was industry. And then not only was the first priority industry, many of the people that regulate are on this revolving door in and out of industry as well. So they may be alongside you as you develop these great public interest plans. And then they may be at the other side of you as they come and lobby against the plans that they helped. So there, there are a number of um, kind of competing and different um, stakeholders who who are in who who don't have the same interest, which is why I always go back to who are we attempting to be on our best day? And I just do not think that we are in our best day because we're also in a system where our AI 
you know, the AI systems that we use to communicate and connect also connected us to an insurrection. So there are a number of different things that need to happen before we can get onto a country first type idea. And then once we're on country first, country for whom type idea. And then once we're there, once we're there to say we want to protect each other from that point, how do we how do we negotiate? But that's going to look different in every national context. And even though I'm very much an Americanist, the one thing that I will say is there are even other questions that should it should um, systems of government that are set up in the West even apply in the global South. So um, kind of a non answer there, but these are certainly the things that keep me up at night. Um, and the last thing I'd say is I want to be safe. I want my children to be safe and I want my neighbors to be safe. And for me, that means protecting the vulnerable. Yeah, I think I think that's such a good point. Um, you know, the public interest, which is always hard to resource, um, but the top of everybody's uh, set of goals. So um, we always navigate in that. And of course, isn't ethics exactly that? Um, I want to say that there is like an amazing set of questions that we are not going to get uh, all to, but uh, I encourage uh, people to keep uh, generating them because um, one of the things we're seeing is some themes. And um, so I'm going to, you know, kind of uh, merge together uh, some similarly themed questions and try to get to as many of them as possible um, because they're great. Um, so there are some, a number of questions that are saying, you know, you look at the AI firmament and um, there are solvable versus non-solvable questions. There's utopian versus dystopian scenarios. Uh, you know, there's overrated versus underrated uh, things. And I think that probably uh, is in the eye of the beholder is my guess. Um, but, you know, as you kind of slice through all of these, you know, what are the what are the big things we should be looking at in the near term, the medium term and the long term that um, really help us get some traction in this space about AI and ethics? Um, I'm going to ask Justice uh, Cuellar uh, to go first in case we lose him. And then uh, I definitely want to hear from Mark and Mutale. Yeah, so let me start with I know underrated, overrated is just sort of in passing as you're working to the gestalt of it all, but I just know I think AI is both overrated and underrated as we humans are. And uh, that's probably a feature of intelligence itself. In the short term, I would say uh, three things. One, uh, better uh, educating the public and policymakers about the properties of AI systems and the likely trajectory. Two, better understanding those properties. There are many, many properties, even if let's just we stick with social media and the sort of algorithmic curated dissemination and processing of information. Um, and then three would be investing now in some uh, solutions to future problems. Uh, so all of that is meant to counterbalance the understandable focus on bias um, in decision-making, which is in the here and now already. But I think that will, not that it'll solve itself, but it'll just, you know, whatever. Um, two, in the medium term, I think, um, dealing with these simulated AGI problems and thinking hard about what role we're willing to give AI in our lives publicly, emotionally, and how do we avoid cultural conflict? And then three, in the long-term global issues, I guess medium to um, the competitive landscape as we begin to depend more and more on AI systems that are in competition with each other across borders, and then also our notions of personhood and our definitions. That's fantastic. Mark, what do you think? Gosh, it's a great a great question of of, of enormous scope and and, and sweep. Uh, I, you know, I think I, I agree one hundred percent with um with with the pieces that uh, Justice Quayar just just mentioned. But I'll, I'll add a couple myself. Um, I'm going to define the short term as you know what should we be doing right now. And I think that the first thing is to just identify where there is actively harm being created. Uh, so some of the examples that have been mentioned by Mutale in her presentation by Justin Cuellar, uh, because the, the technology has outpaced the application of relevant statutes or there is uh, a gap that needs to be filled. So I think that that's uh, the priority for me right now. Uh, one thing I think is gonna be very interesting to watch in the medium term, uh, and, and I too see this you know, bizarre kind of uh, highly 
you know, utopia, dystopia kind of, you know, binar binaristic sort of perception of what the future might look like. I think it's going to be somewhere in between, but I'll just add a data point here for the audience, which is uh, based on Oxford University research and Pew research in the U.S., currently roughly 88% of Europeans and 84% of Americans are somewhat fearful of AI. And I was struck by those figures because, you know, if you, and maybe it's not surprising if you look at all the movies and all the cultural production that features AI, it's almost um, universally dystopian. And then if you look at sort of the more industry narratives, the kind of PR narratives, the hype, it's, it's all very utopian. Um, one thing I think that can be said, and I, I was laughing uh, when Justice Quare uh, talked about persuading people, you know, not actually necessarily mattering that much. I spent most of my career in, 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 in climate change policy in government, and we found that to be the case there. You know, you can, you know, everyone can care a lot, and you still might not get the, the policy movement that you want. Um, and I think that the same thing uh, is something we should keep a watch out on the medium term. Right now, I think it's a very low salience issue. I don't think most people care politically very much one way or the other about the stuff that we're talking about today. I think that as it creeps ever more into their lives, if you get the kind of affective technologies that Justice Square is talking about, sort of, you know, essentially kind of reading people's emotions and, and, and behaviors and, 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 and trying to help them structure their lives based on those inputs, I think people are going to you know, be thinking a little bit more intimately about, about whether they like that or not. And so there may be a kind of rise in that salience and the politics of that I think can get quite interesting. Uh, and then long-term, uh, two things I think on the dystopian side, I think we really need to sort of think about and look out for kind of cascading failures. So where you start to have multiple systems of decision-making uh, kind of interacting with one another, and there's the possibility that relatively small errors can cascade into larger, more systemic errors with bigger, um, bigger harms and, and outcomes. Uh, and then on the more positive side, what I would like us to be doing with the long-term hat on as you know, policymakers and experts and technologists is to really think about how we can not only deal with these harms and risks that we've been talking about on this panel, but create better incentives and structures and mechanisms to incentivize and encourage the development of AI for things that would be just you know, uncomplicatedly good for society. We know that there are a lot of AI use cases, for example, in accelerating the energy transition, you know, forecasting wind and solar uh, at a more granular level and then feeding that into uh, you know, how the power grid operates. There are endless examples in the healthcare domain, many, many examples across almost all industries. Uh, and yet most of the AI that we see developed commercially is not applied towards those uh, issues. Maybe there's not the right kind of business models developed yet. Maybe there's not the right policy environment. But I think we really ought to be focused on that in the long term so that we can make AI work for us instead of uh, just being this sort of thing that we have to manage and, and, and be scared of, that we will still have to manage it and be scared of it. You know, and I want to point out for our audience that just as Koyar had to leave for uh, a pressing, unanticipated uh, thing, but uh, uh, you know, wanted to uh, express his regards to everyone uh, and thank Radcliffe. Um, I, we have an, another set of questions to me, which get down to the, you know, uh, everyone agrees uh, you should have more ethical AI. How do we do that? And um, as I've listened throughout the day, both in terms of this panel and in others, um, you've heard, uh, certainly there was a lot of talk about literacy in our panel. There were talk about assessment. Um, I've heard talk about harm, so we could maybe measure the harm that's done or measure the risk. Um, Mark, in some sense, you just talked about the use cases, so use cases that have more public interest goals than, say, private profit goals. Um, and if you kind of think of um, uh, these and many other kind of strategies to try to, you know, really progress, one of our question ask askers uh, asked, uh, I'm sure that's not the best way to put it. Um, uh, what do you think of as real progress in AI ethics? You know, what have we actually done that um, that we can point to and say, we should do more of these kinds of things? And I think especially for many of us in higher education, you know, I'm a public interest technologist and we have real questions about how do we teach these things that hopefully produce better entrepreneurs, better citizens, better public servants who are more informed 
about the world they live in and can kind of think through these very thorny technical issues. So I guess my question to you is what pragmatic things we can do in any of the sectors and uh, what do you think has succeeded so far? Um, I, I am actually not the biggest fan of the AI ethics framing just because ethics is such a woolly term that means nothing but everything. And then, you know, when I do meet ethicists in um, Silicon Valley, they come from Ivy League schools and they, they talk about, you know, Nietzsche, who also said that um, Black people did not contribute to civilization. So if that's your ethical framework, then I, that's probably not gonna work for me. The one thing that I would say, um, Certainly as I too, I'm a public interest technologist. I'm coming from the social sciences, um, sociology and anthropology specifically. One of the things that I think de definitely does work are having these um, interdisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary uh, work happening where uh, people that are coming from the heavy sciences, the STEM, the computer science, are actually learning about the society in which they are designing and deploying uh, machines into. And I, I think that that's been uh, definitely successful. I've been involved in many of those initiatives myself, whether it be at Stanford, um, where I have a fellowship, or um, Columbia, where I find myself studying now, where I'm using computational methods, but within a social science um, in a within a soci social science context so i think that that's really really um interesting and you can see those intersections with uh you know women's studies and disability studies and um, african-american studies so that you can actually start to see how the how these technologies can improve or um disprove people's lives i i think that for me i'm very much interested in accountability so rather than an ethics framing, just asking, and I, I you know, I speak with very, I speak within industry um, context a lot. People always think because I lead AI for the people, which in itself is a rallying cry to to the masses and and to the interests of the masses. Um, that I wouldn't speak to industry, but I would say that most of the work that we do that is not public is with industry. And one of the things that we, we say to industry is that it is actually good business to create systems that people love and people want to use and that people are not gonna have a backlash against, <laughs> you know? So we're beginning to see that with social media because of some of the great journalism that's going on. And so, Again, it's this kind of going back to the social and invoking existing law. When we wrote the Deepfakes Accountability Act, we didn't say we need a content moderation law. We worked with Daniel Citron and others to say, look, we are being classified as users legally. If we were consumers of the technology, what rights do that, does that invoke under existing US law? And what responsibilities does that push onto the company. And that was really our way of getting around Section 230, but then starting to get the Federal Trade Commission and other bodies who can come in um, and, and look at some of these technologies themselves. It wasn't perfect, but what it did do was open that door of possibility that we can actually invoke the laws that we have and then start to set standards. And I know that when I speak to colleagues, uh, when we work with colleagues in the EU or when we work with colleagues in the, in the UK, they're often asking what's happening in Washington? What's happening um, in Brussels? What's happening on D Downing Street? And how can we get the best of that type of thinking? And we are a small nonprofit. So the other thing that I would say is that people themselves can step up and step into these conversations. And they should, because when people start to personalize how these technologies are being used on them as opposed to being used for them, then you start to see new and interesting thinking that I think lies outside of the existing stakeholders. Because if, we're, if we are just always going to speak to, for ourselves, we are only gonna ask the same, you know, the same questions. And I, I, for one, am ready to move towards action and move towards accountability. Mark? Yeah, I, I, that was a great- 
That was such a great answer, uh, Mutale, and I, I would just, you know, endorse everything that, that was just said. I think a couple of things I'd add in terms of what can we, you know, practically do. Um, three points. You know, one is that uh, I think that there are still a lot of question marks and a lot of unanswered uh, questions and challenges around how can we actually get the regulation right, both at a governmental level, but also sort of industry, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, anything from kind of how decisions are made in the C-suite down to, you know, kind of how products are designed, how they're managed throughout the life cycle. Uh, so I would like to see more experimentation and more uh, kind of sandboxes and more innovative approaches that allow that learning to happen in public and in a way that the results of any given implementation or experimentation can be then you know absorbed or learned from or built on by others. Uh, that's something that we try to do a lot of uh, and I think that I would I would really hope that there's more of it in the years ahead. Another thing that I think has worked very well at the industry side is uh, we've seen a number of companies who have uh, done, I think, a commendable job sort of opening up their um, approaches a little bit more than, uh, you know, is historically typical of uh, private companies in terms of showing kind of how they do compliance or how they do uh, governance of their products. Um, we've had the, the, the fortune of working with a number of companies who have allowed us to basically come in and research how they structure their approaches to uh, AI ethics and regulation within the company. Um, we have a couple of case studies which are on our website of IBM, of Microsoft. Uh, we've, we've worked closely with Salesforce on this as well. Uh, and one thing that I, I really have enjoyed about that work is that they too uh, have a level of uh, epistemic humility about this that um, I think isn't often visible from the outside. I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed at how a lot of companies, while um, not necessarily projecting this publicly, they're reflexive about their own lack of full knowledge of what the right way forward is. And so they have uh, responded to that by doing things like what Mutali mentioned of, you know, bringing in diverse people onto the teams, bringing in people who can ask hard questions. Um, and I think that that's been really encouraging. And I think we should see more of it uh, from companies kind of opening it up. And the last piece on that is um, uh, a little bit in the weeds, but one thing that I think uh, will prove to be very impactful if we can get it done is, is, is something sort of in between that governmental regulation that we've talked a lot about and that industry self-regulation, which is standards, certifications, and third-party audits and assessments. Uh, we've started to see a, a kind of ecosystem go around that, uh, but with some of these technologies, as with you know many other technologies that are highly regulated, uh, we probably shouldn't rely on companies to check their own homework, uh, and we can create a an ecosystem of trust if we have independent disinterested third parties, whether it's certification bodies, you know, like you have for forest products or buildings, whatever it may be, um, who can come in, who can use a standardized approach, uh, you know, put a stamp on it. If things are looking good, come back and review it. It's AI, so it's going to change in a couple of months. Uh, you can't just sort of, you know, one and done. But um, I think that, that we really need to have a, a kind of bigger ecosystem of verification, certification, trust, and assurance. This has been amazing. Um, and I want to, I, I, I just want to, uh, first of all, thank uh, you guys for just such thought provoking uh, and articulate and love and, and fantastic comments. Uh, it's just really been such a pleasure talking with you. Um, somebody earlier to say today said, you know, AI is not magic. Um, but I think that in some sense, when we treat AI as magic, um, which we have in some sense, um, we are likely to get into ethical trouble. Um, AI and, and the information technologies we deal with all the time have really, uh, in a large part, gone from commerce to infrastructure. And it's time to give them the kind of supervision, the kind of oversight, um, uh, create the kind of accountability that we have uh, with infrastructure. Because in the end, uh, we want to control cyberspace rather than having cyberspace control us. So um, I want to thank uh, Radcliffe for a great day and hand things back to Ito. Uh, thank you. What, what a thought-provoking day um, it has been. Um, we began this morning by framing uh, the very wide-ranging uh, topic of artificial intelligence and the myriad ways in which it enhances and challenges and transforms our daily lives.
um, as well as the deeper philosophical questions of what it means to be human, intelligent, creative, ethical. Uh, I'm deeply thankful to our speakers and moderators for exposing us to their work, uh, their thoughts and their aspirations for AI and its role in society. I very much hope that this wide ranging conversation has sparked your interest to learn more about the topic, that it has challenged any preconceived notions, um, and that it has raised new questions and ideas in your minds. Uh, for me, one takeaway from our speakers and moderators today is how incredible human intelligence and creativity are, uh, how far we have come in using this human ingenuity to enable and utilize artificial intelligence and yet how far we still have to go in harnessing this technology to its full potential while maintaining ethical standards and building a long-term long productive human AI partnership. I want to thank each of our panelists and moderators for their fantastic presentations and conversations and our audience for the terrific questions. I also want to thank um, the Radcliffe Academic Ventures and Engagement Team and the events planning and technical teams for enabling such a seamless virtual program. Uh, today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website. We hope that you will join us for future Radcliffe virtual events, including Artificial Intelligence for Pathology uh, on Thursday, December 9th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And please save the date now for Next in Climate Change program on Monday, January 31st, 2022. For information on upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs or to see videos of past events, please visit www.radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.